Now let's cross over to the graphic business Stanbic uh, breakfast meeting which is happening right now at Labadi Beach Hotel. The theme is Achieving Sustainable Exchange Rate Stability our options and uh, at the moment uh, the CEO of Stanbic Bank Al Hassan Andani is the one addressing uh, the gathering. The best jazz entertainment you could ever dream of at the beginning of the year. This is time for hard work and we expect all of you uh, to give up your best so that we can get some solutions to this protracted problem. Our view is that the CD, as our MC has uh, said, for me, is not a creation of any foreign power. The CD is a creation of the people of Ghana, and we have to defend it with our blood at all times. We should not talk down the CD. We should work up the CD. And my take on this is that it's about the choices we make as a country, um, the choices between exports and imports. And I've been having a very interesting conversation with the president of Gupta to say that choices for imports are about consumption and literally anybody can consume. So they tend to be easy choices. Choices about producing goods and services that are of competitive standards, both in your country and outside of the country, are very tough choices. Are we as Ghanaians choosing the easy path which leads us nowhere, or are we choosing the difficult path that would lead us somewhere? And the comment somebody made around being an oil exporter, importer, and wanting foreign exchange, that conversation should have been addressed to the person next to him to say, what are you doing to ensure that you bring in dollars to help me import my oil? So let us just review the situation and say that if you look at the biggest export earners into the US, all those companies and their chief executives and creators are less than 50 years old. All of us sitting in this room, about 45, into that bracket. What choices have we made, like those youngsters, whether they're in Singapore or Thailand or Vietnam or the US, making to ensure that we can make our country globally competitive and bring in exchange to ensure that we can defend our own currency. On this note, I want to entreat our panelists who are leaders of this country to be dispassionate, to be honest, to give us policy choices that can move us forward, as is the motto of Stanley Bank. Welcome to this forum, enjoy it, and contribute. Ms. Azahadani, thank you very much for the opening address. You're formally now welcome to the breakfast meeting, the Stambik the Graphic Business Stomach Band Breakfast Meeting, Achieving Sustainable Exchange Rate Stability, Our Options. Our hashtag this morning is Breakfast Meeting 2019. And you are live on the Join News channel on Multi TV right now. And wherever you are, you can join a conversation using the hashtag I just announced. Welcome. I want to now, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind, with a standing ovation, welcome the governor of the Central Bank, Mr. Enes Adesin, who will give us his uh, opening <laughs> keynote address. A big round of applause for Mr. Adesin. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me begin by first thanking the organizers of this breakfast meeting, Mr. Atu Afol, the MD of Graphic Business, and the MD of Stan Big Bank, Mr. Alas Adani. Also to thank the MDs of the banks that have been able to join us this morning. 
and to thank the organizers again for the opportunity to speak on this topic, achieving a sustainable exchange rate and the options. I believe you would all agree with me that this is a topic that is timely, coming at a time that we have successfully emerged out of a recent bout of volatility in our exchange rate, which has generated a lot of debate domestically as well as externally. It is my expectation that my brief remarks and subsequent discussions will help shape the narrative on the currency and exchange rate management in the context of a small, open, commodity-dependent economy that has adopted a flexible exchange rate regime to underpin the conduct of monetary policy. I think this is an important point to make. First, to understand that we have different exchange rate regimes. You can choose to have a fixed exchange rate or to the extreme, the currency board type of exchange rate regime with rigid fiscal rules and our neighbors have it, the safer zone, they have the currency board arrangement, they, they have very rigid uh, fiscal rules, which means that there's very little that you could use even monetary policy or fiscal policy to do. I think that the judgment is out in terms of the growth performance of countries that have adopted the very rigid exchange rate arrangements, such as our neighbors. And we see it in terms of the areas that are created in that system. One of the reasons why we don't have a free flow of goods and services within our sub-region is because some of these people who man our borders are not being paid. They are fiscal rules. That means that the budget probably doesn't have the financing. It shows up in people not being paid. And therefore, obviously, they have to close an eye to some of the things that happens across the border. So that's, those are some of the uh, difficulties with having that type of exchange rate regime. We have chosen a flexible exchange rate regime in Ghana. We think that it has saved as well. It has helped us uh, in terms of the growth performance that we have all seen in the last few years or so. So yes, as a country, that is the exchange rate that we, we have adopted. I think we need to understand that the exchange rate is only a price. And within that context, as with all prices of goods and services, the exchange rate will respond to the dynamics of the economy and will also be subject to the dynamics of demand and supply. Looking at the history, the flexible exchange rate regime has served Ghana well, given the structural characteristics of our economy. I'm sure those of you of the school of thought that pegging the CD to one of the major currencies to achieve stability might sound appealing. But as I said earlier on, in our view, this has not been very uh, favorable for the growth experience of those countries that have experimented with fixed exchange rate regimes. As we all know, Ghana's economy is import dependent, and therefore the existence of persistent foreign exchange demand pressures by importers. I see that Guta is represented on the panel, and we would hear from them where their issues come from. In addition to these uh, huge demand pressures coming from imports. We also have the issue of repatriation of profits and dividends to foreign-owned companies, which also represent a significant outflow of resources out of our services and income accounts, another source of pressure on the local currency. These developments explain why, even in the context of two years of trade surpluses, which have not translated into current account surpluses. We have seen some bouts 
of exchange rate depreciation. I think I need to emphasize this point, that one of the things that we have seen over the last two years is the improvement in oil export earnings for Ghana. So we have moved away from a situation where Ghana always recorded a trade deficit to becoming a country that is recording a trade surplus on the basis of oil exports. But when you move from the trade account and you get into the current account, you see that we end up with a current account deficit. And the reason for the persistent uh, decline in the value of the currency. Obviously, we need to improve the local content in some of our leading sectors, such as the oil sector, such as the gold mining sector, in order to improve uh, the performance in the income and services account. The strong policy reforms introduced in the last 24 months fiscal consolidation, a complementary monetary policy stance, financial sector reforms, in our view, are yielding the results. And these are the issues of the fundamentals of our economy. We have seen it from the improvement in growth, which has improved from a low of 3.6% in 2016. We have seen it in terms of the drop in the inflation rate from over 15.6% to single digits. We have seen it in the halving of the fiscal deficit and then also through the very strong external payments position. All of these, in terms of the export performance over this period, has also meant that we were able to build reserves to the tune of 7.6 billion in 2017 representing 4.4 months of import cover. Lately, our reserves have moved to $9.9 billion, representing 5.1 months of import cover, following the recent sovereign bond issuance. All of these reflect the attraction of the positive turnaround in the Ghanaian economy to foreign investors who have been contributing to finance the deficits. The growing exposure to foreign investors also means that the country becomes susceptible to movements in global sentiments. And as you know, this was seen in the performance of the CD. Uh, if you look at the performance in 2018, uh, the very significant improvements in the fundamentals, what we call the macro fundamentals, did impact on the value of the CD with a strong performance in 2018 till the week beginning the 21st of May 2018, where the combination of factors, including the US monetary policy normalization, the sharp oil price hikes, and the stronger US dollar impacted adversely on emerging and frontier market economies. This resulted in portfolio reversals from emerging markets to take advantage of higher yields in the US. In Ghana, we saw this through the increased coupon repatriation, which exerted additional pressure on the local currency. At the end of October 2018, the currency had depreciated by 7.8%. At the start of 2019, the CD's volatility reflected the seasonal foreign exchange pressures fueled by the importers and corporates, uh, weakened investor sentiments, concerned about the economic outlook for Ghana as we were on the verge of exiting the IMF program. All of this triggered some outflows, uh, putting additional pressure on the CD, as well as some repatriation of coupons by non-resident investors which contrasted with the past trends of reinvestment of coupon proceeds. Thirdly, as part of the objective to build lost reserves in 2018, uh, the Bank of Ghana decided to work to improve its net international reserve levels to the level at the end of 2018. This required the bank's limited presence in the market. All of these, of course, added to pressures 
on the market and led to a depreciation of the city by 8% as of March 2019, compared with 0.02% in the same period of last year. I think you would all have recently seen the recovery that the currency has experienced, appreciating from the peak of 5.9 Ghana cities to the dollar to current levels, which I think are around 5.1 cities to the US dollar, reflecting the successful reversal of sentiments on the economic outlook, the successful completion of the IMF ECF program, which has served to provide an endorsement of macroeconomic policy and the subsequent release of the last tranche of foreign exchange resources associated with the completion of the program, as well as the positive news which was associated with the 3 billion euro bond inflows, which has improved the country's reserve buffers. In addition, S&P global ratings affirmed its BB long and short-term foreign and local currency sovereign credit ratings on Ghana with a stable outlook. The affirmation of the issues was attributed to Ghana's relatively strong growth prospects, driven in large part by increased oil production, which is expected to support sound fiscal policy management and help deliver a favorable macroeconomic outlook. On these positive accounts, the broad expectation is for a further improvement in the value of the CD over the medium term. I think all that I've tried to say, to break it down, and I think the, the panel will break it down further, uh, hopefully, in the next session, is that the CD is a price. It reflects the supply and the demand. As you all know, on the demand side, we have the importers. On the supply side, you have the exporters. And to the, to the extent that we have more importers than we are supplying, broadly speaking, you see that the currency would, would tend to depreciate. That's, that's the basic fundamental. And I think this is the point that the president was making, that we need to change the narrative on the currency. We need to change the narrative on the currency because so long as we remain import dependent, we would have that bias, the bias of the currency losing its value over time. But in addition to that, there are also the macroeconomic factors which come into play. The way you run your fiscal policy, the way you run your monetary policy, all of these uh, variables also have an impact on, on the behavior of the exchange rate. So, for example, you have non-resident investors in your market that are looking at the return on your domestic bonds. If they see that the interest or yields on other markets are more attractive, they will take their investments out. And the impact of that sort of exit from your bond market would reflect in the value of your CD. Uh, over time. So we have to work. We have to work on all fronts. We have to work to improve our export earnings. We have to work to improve local content uh, in the mining sector, in, in, the, in the oil sector. We have to work to reduce our de import dependency. Uh, if you look at the numbers for imports of rice, for example, you, you, you will be shocked to see how much Ghanaians spend on, on, on buying rights. In addition, we have to also improve our debt management strategies so that we shift the financing of the budget away from non-residents and also away from the sovereign bond financing. I see the article in the graphic business this morning on Ghana mortgaging uh, its future to save the city which I think it's an important point, but uh, we need to refocus the issue more on the budget because the sovereign bond issuances were done to finance the budget. And, and the impact on the exchange rate and the balance 
of payments, I think is a secondary matter. And therefore, the question to ask is, what, what are the use of proceeds from these sovereign bond issuances? And how do you, what, what, what has the government done in terms of utilizing these resources uh, to finance projects that would improve the capacity to export for the country? This is where the question is, rather than just using sovereign bond financing for current expenditures, you want to see that such resources are directed at you know, projects that would have you know, major important implications for the capacity to export, for example. So that, I think, would be one of the important recommendations that should come out of a discussion of this nature at this forum. Obviously, the need to improve the business environment uh, in terms of the ease of doing business would also matter. Look, re-examining our laws to improve business environment, making sure that we have business-friendly regulations which would make it easy to move goods across the country, uh, looking at our retention agreements, uh, in, in, again, in, in the coal and oil sectors, promoting non-traditional exports, et cetera, et cetera. So really, this is really to provide you a teaser into some of the issues that I think the panel will be delving deeper into. So at this point, I believe that these pointers would help to shape the discussions that would follow so that we can all understand the factors that drive our exchange rate and proper solutions that will lead us to a more uh, stable exchange rate path. Thank you very much. You could do it better. That is the governor of the Central Bank, Mr. Ernest Allison, setting the tone for our conversation this morning. And he said a lot. There's a lot to interrogate, obviously. And I know there are people here who experience the CD and the dollar more than anybody else. And so you have a lot to say about what he said. But before we do that and open the floor for everybody to participate, I have a few individuals who are also here to uh, share their own thoughts with us. They, one, study the subject at a very scientific level. They live it on a daily basis, as in Guta and his members. And so it would be interesting to hear their thoughts now that we've had the, the state has been set by the central bank. And so, ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, let's first welcome Professor of Economics at ESA, Professor Peter Quarte, to give us his opening presentation. And he is one of my panelists, and so he will start his presentation, lay the foundation, he will take his seat, the rest will join him uh, as we move forward. Professor Peter Quarte, a round of applause for him, ladies and gentlemen. The Governor of Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be part of this uh, morning's discussion. And let me thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, Mr. Andani said we should be frank and honest with our submission. So that's exactly what we are going to do this morning. So I'll run you quickly within five, 10 minutes what a few points that I've put down. Um, first about the, what I was tasked to do, sustainable exchange rate regime. Is our exchange rate sustainable? It is sustainable when your real exchange rate does not deviate significantly from the equilibrium exchange rate. In other words, if there is no intervention at all, if you allow demand and supply forces to determine your exchange rate, if you don't deviate significantly, then we can say it is sustainable. And that depends on a number of factors, your 
monetary factors, your real factors, and uh, real economy issues, and of course, how much reserves our central bank is able to hold, and several other factors. I need to make this point that no country has maintained one exchange regime over a long period. You can have a floating, you can have a fixed. Sometimes we have manage floating, so just like we do anytime there's a need for the central bank to intervene, we see our central bank stepping in as and when necessary. So um, that has to be noted. How well have we done? The technology is failing me. Oh, yes. How well have we done in terms of our city's performance? To what extent have we stayed on course? And uh, I think the governor went through this quite um, well. But you see that the depreciation didn't start today. It's been there since 1993. 92, 93, 93, we had the highest rate of depreciation, followed by 2014, and then the recent spate of depreciation. So it's not new. It, it tells you that our currency is weak, it's not strong enough. Uh, but I must also say that other currencies have done worse than our CD, and all of us have to work towards ensuring that our currency becomes stable. So this graph shows the recent spate of depreciation that we experienced. And I think the governor explained this quite well, so I wouldn't waste much time on that. And of course, the factors that causes our history depreciation, um, returns on capital outflow, expectations um, that drives that shocks and speculations. We see a lot of that happening on our economy. The recent IMF exit brought a lot of speculation that once they leave, we'll not be able to manage our economy. And I have witnessed a few visits from international financial institutions coming to assess our risk profile. And often and then they call on me to find out whether really our economy is stable enough to withstand the exit of the IMF. So speculations are quite key. Our monetary policy, the central bank's role, fiscal deficit, inflation um, are all critical. Then the real sector uh, issues. We don't produce enough. We consume almost everything from toothpick to Brazilian hair, anything you just mentioned, we import them. Preference for foreign goods. And, and many, many others. So I think we, we ought to be producing. So, but I'll focus my next five minutes on, I think this is where I want us to talk um, frankly and dispassionately. One is sustainable exchange rate. What, what are the best practices? What can we do to show up our currency? Enforcing the foreign exchange regulations I think if you recall, 2014, 2015, when uh, there was an attempt to enforce the regulations, it didn't work too well. Uh, I think it backfired. Why did it happen? Well, the perception was that government was trying to control, it was an, a control regime. So market players also reacted, and that did not help us. We need to do that, do this more carefully now. We should track demand. That's one area we feel uh, in this country. People walk in and import or exchange foreign currency. We are not able to track demand effectively. If you go to South Africa, Kenya, Uganda, you cannot exchange currency without showing your passport. You cannot. And I'll share a quick, quickly share an experience with you. I had a gentleman from one of the international banks from South Africa. He said in his hotel, he took out his money, took out his passport, as is done in a decent economy. 
to change. He was giving the money, the teller or the receptionist never looked at his passport. He was that shocked. He was shocked. Hotels, forest bureaus, we don't track this. And, and I think I'm happy the governor is here. I have seen a circular written in December 2018 from the Bank of Ghana requesting all forest bureaus, etc., to be doing this. To what extent are they doing it? I think it's about time we track this carefully. Then the black market, they are driving the exchange rate strongly. These days you can sit in the comfort of your home, call them and then they'll come in on an Okada. And, and whatever amount you need, they will supply easily. So I think that's an area we need to be uh, working on. And then the Chinese, we trade a lot with China. We do a lot of trading. Our traders, a lot of them go to China. I was involved in the study where we look at um, transnational traders. Uh, so I was in Mokala and other places we interviewed traders. Now, what do they do? They import, when they want to import or they want to go to China, they get the dollars. And some go as much as $500,000. They go through our ports. You ask yourself, what do the security people do? And some of them were telling us, you see, when they get to China, customs will ask them to display the money on the table. So they count each of them check before they are allowed out. Some of the taxi drivers know that they are carrying this amount of money. So even to them, it is very, very risky. And I think this is an area, I'm happy Guta is here. Guta is an area I want you to challenge or educate your members. Why carry $500,000 and above on you to a foreign country? I think we are not helping the exchange rate and that is something we need to work on. The use of visa cards and, 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 and the like. Um, Sandani, I think your people should also look at that. How do we make it cheaper for traders to patronize the visa cards so they don't have to carry all these amounts of money on them? And then there's also a talk about fixing the exchange rates at the ports so that if you import goods and you have to pay duty, it doesn't fluctuate frequently. At least for a quarter, there could be a fixed rate and then it's revised as and when the exchange rate uh, depreciates. Okay, so those are the, some of the short-term measures. Then the long-term, there are quite a few things we can do. One is growing the export base. growing the export base, um, buying made in Ghana goods. But it's not just buying made in Ghana goods. I think our producers should also live up to expectation. Our goods should be up to international standards. I had an encounter, our experience of, you know, I championed made in Ghana goods. I said, look, let me buy local rice. Um, we try cooking local rice and it didn't work out. I mean, all the other foreign rice that we have cooked, we didn't have to use any different method or technology. It's the same water and rice cooker and whatever. So I think we should make our things more friendly, user-friendly, uh, meet international standards. We don't have to have separate standards for our goods and another standard for uh, the ones we import. Of course, managing the debt, the governor has spoken about that. Um, one area that worries me is the amount of foreign denominated debt or bonds that uh, we are accruing. Because they can, they can make or make you, these investors can just exit the market and you will be found wanting. Um, our debt GDP ratio has uh, come down. Um, at the moment, I'm told it's about 58 or 59 percent thereabout. But we need to 
58.98% debt GDP ratio. Um, we are still being described as um, a country that is of, at risk of high debt distress, and that is something we ought to check. Increased foreign debt is something I have uh, mentioned, that the risk of capital flight and its effect on our exchange rate is quite significant. Growing the real economy, very important. We need an export, expanded export base, not the basic commodities that we continue to produce. Let's expand non-traditional exports. And even the oil revenue, luckily we have oil revenue. We need to channel some of these funds into the real sector. See, Nigeria had this problem. They didn't diversify. In 2016, there was a recession because when oil prices kept going down, they couldn't manage it. Let's avoid the mistakes of the past or what our neighbors have done and diversify our production. Imports, we import almost everything. Now, because there are no jobs, when people find a bit of capital, they go to Togo, some go to Nigeria, depending on the size of your capital, Dubai, China. So we import almost everything. One thing we import so much is rice. If you look at UNCTAD trade statistics, rice is the sixth amongst our imports. The sixth. The first automobile uh, for transport, automobile for goods, and then as you come down, it's rice. If we are able to produce more rice, can you imagine the amount of foreign exchange we will save for this country? That would be a lot. Our planting for food and jobs program, would this address this challenge? And I always keep saying that we have a brilliant industrial strategy, the 10 point industrialization strategy. If we are able to implement 60 to 70% of what is said in there, Ghana would be a better place for you and I to live in. So let us reduce our import demand by producing more. Supply shocks and inflation. Then the fiscal, I think the governor touched on the fiscal situation. Um, we, we always run in budget deficits and that does not help us. We borrow to finance some of this. Uh, it is good to borrow, but you don't borrow to consume. You invest so that we yield returns to finance the debt. So in conclusion, uh, distinguished guests, I think the macro fundamentals, they are key. Let us work on them. Real GDP growth, fiscal deficit, inflation, and then of course the debt issue. And then the short term spikes uh, in, in the slippages that we have in our budget, we need to address this. Uh, medium term, long term strategies, growing our real sector, managing imports, and of course productivity. Our productivity level is so low. We hire people, we employ them, but with very low productivity. And I think that is one of the challenges most employers face. Our productivity is just too low. Unless you are there to supervise, we get very little out of the people we employ. Enforcing exchange rate regulations, Mr. Governor, I think that's one area I would be very excited if we are able to enforce this effectively. The black market operators, are we going to regulate them? Maybe we can register them, give them numbers, license, tax, and then make sure we know how much they take in or out of our country facilitating trade between Ghana and China through our banks. The amount of fiscal dollars we carry out is enormous, and that is not helping the foreign exchange uh, or our city. On that note, I think I will stop. The rest, we can take it up for discussion. Thank you very much. Professor Kote, thank you very much. A round of applause for him. I'll quickly move on to my next panelist, Dr. Joseph Obey. He's the president of Guta, uh, who will share a few thoughts with us. 
um, because of obvious constraints with time, you're going to leave a bit of the conversation to when you're seated. So five minutes for Mr. Obin to lay his foundation. And then, Mr. Obin, please approach and, and let's, let's get into the details. A round of applause for him, and then we'll get into the conversation. Thank you very much for the recognition of the ordinary trader to be part of this discourse. Um, the governor of the Central Bank of Ghana, Dr. Addison, fellow panelists. Before I talk about the effects of depreciation on the trading community, I want to give us all some comfort. We of the trading community, through Guta Ghana Union of Traders Association, have initiated what we call the income in, income out policy to help boost exports. Income in, income out simply means that we go overseas to our source our goods. And so when we are going, we want to send some goods from Ghana. And so we use the proceeds thereof also to buy the goods. And we are um, going to develop this policy with the Ghana Export Promotion Authority. So we are also thinking positively in this aspect. Thank you. I have to let everybody know how depreciation affects it. And so we, when we are discussing it, we know that it is for a genuine cause to do to solve a very big problem. For the businessman, loss of capital when there's depreciation, it simply means loss of capital. My capital of importation is $100,000. Generally, the exchange rate was 4.8. And now, at that time, if I wanted $100,000, I have to find 480,000 Ghana cities. Now, as I'm speaking, the dollar rate is 5.2. My capital have to be increased before I can still maintain um, $100,000. I have to increase it in cities. Means that I have to go and find 520,000 Ghana cities, which means that I have to make a top up of 40,000 Ghana cities. If I do not have the top up, it means that my capital has to be reduced because I can only buy a short of $8,000 it means that I can only buy $92,000. I haven't done anything bad. I haven't misused my money for any bad thing. My, my capital has been spirited away with a whooping $8,000. Even if I want to put this money into my saving, still, the real value 
of my saving is also being depleted by the same calculation that I did if I have to remove it. So sometimes people have to go into their savings, remove it, and save it in the forest rather than leaving them at the bank. Increase depreciation also increase cost of doing business. No, we use the dollar as a benchmark for calculation of duties. So anytime the exchange rate goes up, it means that my duty is also going up. Fortunately, this problem is being solved, is being tackled, and the exchange rate or the dollar has been pegged for the purposes of duty payment. Other costs relating to my business is utility tariffs. The increase of utility tariffs as a result of the depreciation and fuel prices as well. Fluctuation of the currency is also not helping me because it does not enable stability in pricing. My competitor brought his goods earlier on at a different exchange rate. I have just brought mine and then the rate is very high. There's a strict competition in the market. He is not prepared to go down or go up with his price. Do I have to hold up my stock? That's the prudent way to do at such circumstances. Because then you have to hold up your stock. But how can you hold up your stock and wait till prices go up? Because probably your capital is also borrowed and then interest rate might be going up. Planning and forecasting my business also become very difficult for me. And then in the sub-region where we trade together, my prices are not competitive. My distributors will then have to go to Togo, Nigeria to go and buy. And it will affect my turnover. Anytime there is depreciation, speculations, and hoarding setting, thereby making it difficult to assess foreign exchange. These are some of the problems that I will talk about. I will not only dwell on the problems without at least saying something. I know the experts are here to deal with it. But then, we also have some observation to make. Increase in exports is the only sure way out, as most um, speakers have said. But after getting the resources, the revenue, or the supply of the forest from this increase of export, what next? That's what the governor said in his speech about the recurrent issues, the current expenditure things. Forest, all right. We have the supply, all right, but we do not have retention of sin. There should be a retention policy so that the most profitable areas of our economy, like the service industry, the extractive industry, when I say service, communication, and banking, 
and then the extractive industry being um, gold mining, oil mining, bauxite, and the rest. All these profitable, huge profitable areas are being dominated by foreigners. And they have the right to repatriate the benefits of their investment, that's their profit. But then, have we done a conscious effort to also invest in this? You're still with us here on the Joy News channel.